My name is Cindy Murphy and I am a patent attorney and I'm going to talk to you about patents today. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri original, well, originally, although I live, I've lived in Ohio for over 30 years, but one of the legends in St. Louis is the World's Fair of 1904. And as the story goes, there was a stand with ice cream and there was a stand with waffles. And the ice cream stand was serving ice cream in bowls with spoons and the waffle stand was selling waffles that they would sprinkle and then people would eat. What's going to happen is the ice cream stand is going to run out of bowls. And this is back in the days when we had the ice boxes instead of refrigerators. So you had to sell the ice cream by the end of the day or it would just melt and you wouldn't be able to sell it. So here we are at the ice cream stand with no bowls and a lot of ice cream we need to sell. And that is going to be the birth of the ice cream cone invention where the waffle, waffle man is going to take his waffles, curl it into a container, and then they're going to put the ice cream in there so that the ice cream stand can sell its ice cream. Now there's three tests that we need for patentability, and so we're going to look at the ice cream invention for those three tests. The first one is utility. Novelty, the second one is novelty, and the third one is non-obviousness. Utility is, it has to be useful for something. You just can't come up with a new chemical and say, I have this new chemical, nobody's ever come up with it before. And if somebody says, what do you use it for? You say, I don't know, you can't get a patent on that. Or you can come up with a new device, like a new device, and if there's no use for it, then there won't be any utility. Most entrepreneurs are going to come up, are going to automatically satisfy the utility test because when you're, when you're looking at something, it's a product that you can actually use for something and you're satisfying the need. So I would say of the three tests, that's probably the easiest. Novelty is, has it ever been done exactly the same way before? Now with the ice cream cone, that was not exactly the same as the ice cream in the bowl. So we had novelty there. And that is going to be, if you look in the mirror, do you see the exact same thing? If the prior art does not have anything out there that's exactly the same, then you've satisfied the novelty test. The non-obvious test is the one where it gets very interesting in patent law. And what that is going to be is if the test of, if I knew I had ice cream in a bowl with a spoon and I knew I had a waffle, would it have been obvious to come up with the ice cream cone invention? Because you're really just putting those two things together. That's going to be evaluated over the person of ordinary skill in the art. Would a person of ordinary skill in the art looked at the waffle and looked at the ice cream in the bowl and said, hmm, a very easy, obvious thing to do is to make it into an ice cream cone container and then put the ice cream into it. That's In this situation, I, um, I would say that the ice cream cone invention is not obvious because for years you had the waffles and for years you had the ice cream and they were being sold side by side at fairs and no one else had ever come up with this before. So this is going to be the, um, I'm going to say that the ice cream cone is not obvious. Now this is a very subjective test, needless to say, which is why you need a very good patent attorney like me. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about is claim scope because when I'm getting a patent on something, it's all going to go down to what I put in the claims. And the claims are going to be where I define my invention on what I consider my invention to be. Now you don't want it too big or it's going to cover the prior art. And prior art is everything that's been done before by everyone else. So in this situation, we can't have our claim scope too big or it will cover not only our ice cream cone invention, but it'll also cover the ice cream in the bowl. So if we look at a, an example of a claim that's too big, it would be a food product comprising a receptacle having an open top and a closed bottom, and an edible substance scooped into the open top of the receptacle. And we can't make it too small or it won't cover enough. 
So if we make it too small, we would say a food product comprising an edible receptacle having an open top and a pointed bottom and an edible substance scooped into the open top of the receptacle. Now that's going to cover the ice cream cone with the pointed bottom, but it's not going to cover an ice cream, ice cream container that doesn't have the pointed bottom. So a just right one, when you're writing your claims, just right, it's going to cover everything that you consider your invention, but not the prior art. So here's an example of a claim for this ice cream cone invention that I think would be just right. It would be a food product comprising an edible receptacle having an open top and a closed bottom. So that way, since it's edible, it's not the same as the bowls that we were using before and an edible substance scooped into the top of the receptacle. So let's say that that's our claim and we get an ice cream cone patent on that claim. So now we have to look at our competitors and what they're going to do um, when they see that our great ice cream cone invention come out and everybody wants to buy it and they don't have anything to compete with it. So let's say our evil competitor comes up with a flat bottom ice cream cone invention. Now, um, and their theme song would be flat bottom ice cream cones, you make the rockin' world go round. Now, is this going to be patentable? Is our competitor's flat bottom ice cream cone going to be patentable? Well, it's going to have utility because it's just like our original ice cream cone invention. You can use it to hold, you can use it for ice cream, which is definitely useful. And it's going to be novel because the closest prior art is going to be our pointed bottom ice cream cone invention, and it's not, it's not the same as that. So it's going to be novel. Um, Non-obvious, that's going to be a question. If we have the flat bottom ice cream cone, we have the pointed ice cream cone before, and we have the ice cream cone in the bowl that sat on the table, would it have been non-obvious to come up with the flat bottom ice cream cone? Because what our competitor is saying is, my ice cream cone is better because when you want to take a break, you can set it down on the table and it stands up where the pointed one doesn't. So let's look at the claims that the, the competitor would, would submit. The flat bottom ice cream cone invention, it would be a food product comprising an edible receptacle having an open top and a flat bottom and an edible substance scooped into the open top of the receptacle. That's going to be not too big because it doesn't cover the prior art, it doesn't cover the ice cream in the bowl, and it also doesn't cover the pointed bottom ice cream cone. And it's not going to be too small because it's going to cover pretty much any ice cream cone that has the flat bottom, which is the magic feature of their invention. So it's going to be just right. So I would argue that they would probably get a patent on the flat bottom ice cream cone patent. Again, very subjective, depends on how good your patent attorney is, but I think arguments can be made that it is an improvement because you can set it down on the table, which you can't do with the pointed bottom one. So is it patentable? We're going to say for the purposes of this discussion, yes, because they had a really good patent attorney like me. Now, right to market. Now we have to look at, even though I have a patent, to, can I actually market this thing? Can I market it? Can my evil competitor market the flat bottom? And the answer is going to be no, even though he got a patent on it. What's going to happen is this, the flat bottom ice cream cone is going to infringe the original ice cream cone patent. If you look at, here we have the original uh, ice cream cone patent claim, and if you look at the flat bottom ice cream cone, we have a food product. It comprises an edible receptacle having an open top and a closed bottom, and we've got an edible substance scooped into the open top of the receptacle. So what's going to happen is because our competitor's flat bottom ice cream cone is covered by the claims of our original ice cream cone patent, they are going to be considered an infringer, which means that we can stop them from making that ice cream cone. And infringement occurs when you make a product that is covered by the claims of someone else's patent. So in this case, the flat bottom ice cream cone literally infringes the claims of the original ice cream cone patent. 
So if we look at our timeline, um, if you look at the patent term of the original ice cream cone patent, we, get a, we have a 20 year term. So for 20 years, we have a patent term and we can also make the ice cream cone, the pointed ice cream cone patent. What's gonna happen for our competitor is their patent term is also going to start back in the same time as our patent term and it's gonna go farther, but they have no right to market their flat bottom ice cream cone until our original pointed one expires. So if you look at the, the chart there, they have to wait for it to expire before they have the right to market. So if we look at our timeline here, we have, a, we have a period of time when really nobody can make the flat bottom ice cream cone. If you're the manufacturer of the pointed ice cream cone, you can't make it because your competitor has a patent on it. If you're the competitor, you can't make it because it infringes the original ice cream cone patent. So what can happen in this situation is nobody can make it, or we can employ something that's called licensing. And licensing is a written agreement where you're giving someone permission to use the claims to use your patent, to, to, cover, to make a product that's covered by your patent. So in this situation, we could license our competitor to our original ice cream cone patent so that they would be allowed to manufacture their flat bottom one, and our, our competitor could license us so that we were allowed to make not only the pointed one, but also the flat bottom one. So now we have, we've talked about licensing, we've talked about infringement, and everything seems well, but now I'm gonna throw another um, wrench in it. We're gonna talk about soft serve ice cream. Um, and when you have scoopable ice cream, you take a scoop, you take it from the container, you scoop it and you put it into the ice cream cone. With soft serve ice cream, we're really not scooping it. We're sort of dispensing it, so it's sort of pouring or, or going into the ice cream cone. There's not really a lot of scooping going along there. Now, if we look back at our original ice cream cone patent, we had an edible receptacle having an open top and a closed bottom, and we have an edible substance scooped into the open top of the receptacle. But when we have the soft serve ice cream, it's really not being scooped. So there's really no literal infringement of that. But you know what, the bottom line is, you feel like somebody stole the invention, even though they're using the soft serve ice cream. Because the important part of our patent wasn't that you were scooping the ice cream into the edible re receptacle, it was that it was turning up in there one way or the other. So we have no literal infringement. What's gonna happen is, First of all, you need to be very careful and look at every word when you're writing your claims because who would have thought that word scooped would come back to haunt us, but it did um, with the soft ice cream. But there's also something called the doctrine of equivalence where if you feel like somebody stole your invention um, and it isn't covered literally by the wording, you still can, get you can still ha have them stop under the doctrine of equivalence. Now, there's a couple, we talked about the original ice cream cone patent, and this is gonna be just a couple examples of here of what's going to come after the original ice cream cone patent. Because one of the purposes of patents is for other people to look at what you did and build on it. So if you remember with the original ice cream patent, ice cream cone patent, what we did is we took a flat waffle and we cold, coiled it into a, a cone shape. In this one here, this 1920 patent, what's gonna happen is you're actually just going to form the cone in a cone shape from the beginning. So you're gonna take the waffle sort of batter and put it in there with the machine and you're gonna make it into the cone shape, which is going to save the trouble of having to make it flat and then fold it. This is going to be a 1933 patent where you're going to have a hole in the bottom and then you're going to have something that allows you to push the ice cream up. This is going to be a 1927 patent where you've got strengthening ribs on the outside of the cone so that it doesn't break as easily or crush within your hands. This is going to be a 1937 patent. Here's a 1937 patent where you have a uh, 
trowel or what at the top of the cone so that your ice cream cone doesn't fall out. If you've ever had an ice cream cone and you have two scoops in there and one of them falls out, you'll appreciate the genius of this invention. So now what we have is an ice cream cone where we've got sort of a top bowl there that's going to hold it in place and that's going to be a 1937 patent. This is going to be a 1927 patent and on this one we're going to have the strengthening ribs that go around the outside and all the way up and down but it's also going to allow the cones to be stacked within each other. In 1931, we're going to have a patent here where the ribs are on the inside. And the interesting thing about this patent is these ribs don't only strengthen, but they're actually going to grip the ice cream cone. So they're going to perform the dual function of strengthening the bowl with the strengthening ribs because of the increased material, but also they're going to sort of go into the ice cream in a fork or tong-like manner and hold it in there more securely. Here's going to be another ice cream cone invention from 1934 and what this is going to be is have sort of a fake bottom in there so that you don't have to fill the whole ice cream, a whole cone up with ice cream. This is going to be another patent from 1937 where you've got a bunch of strengthening ribs along the top and along the bottom. And then this is going to be an ice cream um, cone invention in 1936 where you actually have little pedestals or fences that come up along the top of it to hold the ice cream cone in there. This is going to be a 1990 patent. We're going to skip ahead a little bit here. What, but this is going to be is you're just seeing one half of the ice cream cone there. You put two of those together and you can have two different flavors of ice cream that remain separated. Another kind of patent that's going to come into play every once in a while is going to be called a design patent. And what design patents cover is the way a product looks, the way a certain product looks, as opposed to the utility patents that we talked about before where it covers the way something works. So in this situation, when you get a design patent, and there's certain situations where design patents work very well, and in, in those situations, they're worth getting. But this, in the design patent, is just going to cover the way things look when you look at them as opposed to the way they work. So here are just a few examples of some design patents. And this would probably be my favorite because it's shaped like a baseball at the top and a bat at the bottom. And here's another one. So that is an overview of patents and how you can use them to protect not only ice cream cone inventions, but any inventions that you may come up with. Now that we've learned everything there is to know about patents, we can move on and talk about another form of intellectual property, which is trade secrets. And I like to use the example of ice cream again. And in 1929, Tom Corvell is going to begin selling ice cream from the trunk of his car. He's going to, on Memorial Day weekend, he's going to suffer a flat and he can't drive his car anywhere. So what he's going to do is start selling ice cream right out of his truck to the people that are going by on the busy road. This is going to be the birth of the ice cream parlor. For the first time, it's going to occur to someone that I don't have to be driving around to sell ice cream. I can be stationary and people will come to me. Tom's going to go on with this business and he's going to develop an electric freezer that produces the soft ice cream of the custard-like consistency and a pump for dispensing this ice cream from a spout. So this is going to be the soft ice cream as opposed to the scoopable. He's going to patent the pump. So Tom's going to use a patent to protect his pump that actually pumps the ice cream out in the soft serve farm. But he's going to keep the ice cream formula a secret. And he's going to treat this as a trade secret so that in 1979, uh, Mr. Mr. Carvel is going to be in, under a investigation by the state uh, for um, just looking into his records and auditing things and things like that. And the state is going to ask him to disclose the ice cream recipe. And he's going to claim that it's a trade secret and he's not going to be required to disclose that. Now in 2009, this is going to come up again and it's going to be for the investment banks having to disclose what the 
bonuses and salaries of certain people were like and they're going to call what they say is still called the ice cream defense that they don't have to disclose those because they're trade secrets. Now they're going to lose on that argument because bankers at different banks routinely call each other and talk about how much money they're making. So this is not going to hold up. But the ice cream defense lives till today and so you can depend on trade secrets to protect your intellectual property provided that you can keep it secret and it stays secret once you put your product out on the market. So trade secrets are another way of protecting intellectual property. Now with patents you have to go to the patent office and actually get a patent. With trade secrets the way you get a trade secret is you keep something secret. You treat it as a secret. One of the most famous trade secrets is the Coca-Cola formula, which there is not a patent on, but it's a trade secret and they keep it locked in a safe and only certain people know what it is. So trade secret is a very viable and legal form of protecting intellectual property but it, does, it protects you as long as it remains secret. If you have a product that you put out in the market and people can de determine everything they need to know about it by looking at it, a trade secret is not going to do you any good. With trade secrets, the important thing is that not only that you keep it a secret, but that it can be kept a secret. If you come up with a new type of coffee cup that has a special handle, you can't treat it as a trade secret because the minute it goes on the shelf, people will be able to see what kind of handle it has and make it themselves. If you come up with a secret formula for making better coffee that nobody can figure out, then you might have means for a trade secret protection. But you have to treat it as a trade secret, keep it safe, and when I say keep it safe, I mean keep the formula in a safe and make sure that not everyone knows about it because you only want the people at your company that need to know about it to know about it. Anything that can be reverse engineered or figured out how it's made can't be protected by a trade secret because if somebody wants to make it, they can just buy your product, reverse engineer it, and then come out with their own. But trade secrets work very well in certain situations where someone cannot figure out from the product that you put on the market what the intellectual property is or the invention or the formula that went into it. So now we're going to talk about another type of intellectual property, trademarks. And if you go back to our ice cream example, Ben and Jerry's would be example of a trademark in the ice cream world. The important thing about a trademark is that it's an adjective that describes the source of your product. So Kodak cameras is a good example of a trademark that's an adjective. Apple computers, Exxon gas station, Starbucks coffee, Nike running shoes. Now a trademark should not be a noun and if you have people start treating your trademark like a noun it will become what's called generic and no longer function as a noun. When you say, let's go jump on the trampoline, you're using that as a noun. Trampoline is an example of a trademark that's become generic, and now we use it as a noun. Because when you say, let's go jump on the trampoline, you're not saying, let's go jump on this thing made by this particular manufacturer. You're saying, let's go jump on a trampoline regardless of who it's made for. Or if you say, I have a headache, do you have any aspirin? Aspirin is another example of a trademark that's become generic because when you ask somebody, do you have an aspirin, you're asking for any brand of aspirin. You're not asking for a specific one. Another example of a trademark that's become generic is escalator. When you say you can take the escalator to the second floor, you're using that as a noun and the thermos will keep the coffee hot. Thermos used to be a trademark and now we use it generically as a noun. So trademark goes to the identity. It protects the source identity associated with the product surface to which it is attached. So here is different kind, there are different kinds of trademarks that you can come up with. 
It can be a word like Kodak, Nike, MGM, UPS. Um, it can be a phrase like just do it, I'm loving it. It can be a logo, just a picture like the Nike Swish or the McDonald's Arches. It can be a color. UPS has uh, the color brown associated with them. Certain kinds of corning insulation have the color pink associated with them. And John Deere has the color green associated with it. A trademark can also be a sound. If you remember the chimes that you hear from the NBC, that's considered a trademark. And also the lion roar that you hear at the beginning of certain movies is considered a trademark. Another type of, type of trademark is a character, like the Pink Panther, the Michelin Man, the Pillsbury Doughboy, or the Energizer Bunny. And also shape, called trade dress, can also be considered a trademark if it identifies the identity of your company. So consumer confusion is the issue that comes into play when you are picking a trademark. If you look at the word Delta, it is used as a trademark for airplanes, for faucets, and for dental care. The reason you can do this is because when you go on a Delta plane, you don't think, gosh, this is a great plane and they make really nice faucets and have good dental care too. You know that all three of these companies are separate entities. If you were to start a helicopter company, however, and call it Delta, you might be in a trademark or confusion, you might be confusing some people because they might think it's coming from the same company as the airplanes. If you started making luggage under the name Delta, there might be an association that luggage is associated with airplanes and therefore Delta, the airplane manufacturer, might say that there's consumer confusion. So you want to look at the strength spectrum when you're figuring out what you want your trademark to be. The most powerful trademarks are fanciful, like Kodak, Apple, Nike, Starbucks, and Exxon. They're very fanciful. And Apple has nothing to do with computers. We now associate the, the word Apple with a computer company, but that has nothing to do with computers. Now, if you have a fruit company that you name Apple, that's not going to be a fanciful mark because it's going to describe a certain kind of fruit. But you're different. The more, uh, the more remote it is from your product, the more it's considered fanciful and the more protection you're going to be given. Suggestive is something that it sort of suggests what your product is all about. Greyhound for buses, well, a greyhound is fast, and you might be trying to suggest that your bus service is fast. 7-Eleven um, for convenience stores, that used to be suggestive that they were open from 7 in the morning till 11 at night, or at least suggestive that, that they were open for extended hours. Citibank is going to be suggestive that this is a bank that serves cities. And Jaguar is also going to be suggestive that you're dealing with a very strong and or fast vehicle. Descriptive is going to be something that is not only suggestive but very descriptive. Uh, lens crafter for eyeglasses because you're making lens, that's going to be considered descriptive. Frosted mini wheats is going to be considered descriptive because they're frosted. And Computer Land, a store for selling computers, will be considered descriptive. And finally, generic is going to be ones that describe the actual, the actual product itself. And that would be aspirin, thermos, escalator, trampoline, which those started out as powerful, perhaps fanciful trademarks but then because everybody associated them with a product as instead of a company, they've become generic and are no longer capable of functioning as a trademark. So what you want to do when you're picking a trademark is pick something that is not overly descriptive and you don't want it to become generic. You want to always let it associate with yours. And you also want to pick a trademark that is not the same as another company that's making the same thing as you're making because you want to establish for the public that your, your company is very different from that company. 
So now we've covered trademarks and trade secrets and also patents and that should give you a very nice overview of intellectual property for entrepreneurs.